tonight, our guest is Lisa Christine. And, and how many of you were familiar with her work before tonight? Oh, so you've got this fan, built-in oh, cool. fan club already. For those of you who do not know Lisa, I'll give you a very brief bio, but we're going to go to, into some of these things a little bit further. So Lisa is really a world-renowned photographer who a great part of her work has uh, been the documentation of indigenous peoples throughout the world, often the third world. But more recently, she has begun to focus her work on the issues of human slavery. And we're going to get into that tonight. And interestingly enough, uh, you know, we talk about slavery, and we think it's a problem that is distant from our shores, and when in fact, uh, uh, there's a, even a, a horrible problem in the United States. And this is really probably more characterized by the sex trait. Lisa's been, what, to over 100 in some countries? Yes. Yeah, and, uh, and into some very dangerous, tight situations. So as much as she's this beautiful, fragile-looking woman, you don't want to meet her in a dark alley. Uh, but so uh, let's begin. Uh, I will tell you that Lisa and I met... Uh, in 2009? I think so. Uh, and she was the sole exhibitor at a uh, peace summit up in Vancouver where she was showing her work. And I was so uh, drawn to her work and uh, we began a conversation and then we've become uh, actually good friends since that time. So Lisa, maybe you can... Because I always say in these conversations, there's always a backstory yeah. as to why people do what they do. What drew you to photography in the first place? And then we'll talk about later in, this, in regard to this particular topic of slavery. Sure. Um, interestingly, when I was a, a little kid, well, my beginnings were not so easy. They were a bit chaotic. I never quite knew what was going to happen, and I used to kind of... Um, hide away in a little corner of a room with my mother's great anthropology books. And I would go through them and I would marvel at these, these ancient people that their, their bodies were so covered with, with mud and, and feathers that frankly they resembled the earth itself. And I think as a kid that I thought that they had some, they were unshakable to me. They looked like these pillars that, that could not be harmed, and they seemed very centered. And I remember being pretty young and, and you know, resolving that when I was old enough, um, I would go find them and I would ask them how it is that they cultivated this. So um, interestingly, um, my mother died in 1997, and her partner, Duncan, they'd been together for 17 years, had um, brought to my home this book that had belonged to my mother that I clearly recognized from my childhood. And when I went through it, I had literally been to every single tribe in that book. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was really touching to me. Oh. And um, I think uh, f for me, photography, um, which I really began doing at age 11, because my aunt and uncle, who in part raised me, had gifted me this Olympus OMG camera. And my cousin, four years my senior, had a dark room in his home. And so even back then, I made these images of people, of uh, friends and family. But when I look at them, though they're, they're really quite poor, <laughs> they still house that spirit of an individual more in contemplation than, than in sort of this laughter or family like affair kind of thing. And um, I, I think it just always stayed with me. And, and you know, when I hit 18, I, I wanted to go. And um, I, I saved up money over a few years, and I actually spent five years out of the country uh, living with different people, sitting in, in a lot of um, contemplative environments, learning about myself and, and what I believe to be meaningful to me. And I feel like that time really sculpted largely who I am, I mean, entirely. And throughout it, I always had camera in hand and made images. And that's how it all began, you know, searching out dignity. Well, and, and you know, it's interesting just that word dignity. You know, it's we often hear people who are quite uh, isolationist in their view, and it it sort of fascinates me because most of, most of these people, 
typically are people who've never traveled, they've never reached out, they stay in this sort of in, in, enclosed environment, and they never get the richness of experience of other people. And it's sort of fascinating because, isn't it, that we look at the history of, if you will, colonialism, where essentially it was this forced uh, imposition of a foreign culture on, in fact, a group of people who were often much wiser and uh, uh, more together than the, uh, the colonialist. Uh, have you found that as you've traveled that uh, the reality is that we're basically all one in the sense that everyone wants the same thing, everyone's searching for the same thing, a great part of which is just dignity and respect? Yeah, I, I really actually, um, in visiting so many people and, and people that live in, in, in different parts of society and some that are extremely poor and some that are very wealthy, I actually think that, that people do want the same thing. In fact, I don't know if you've seen that documentary that was just made called Happy. I think it's called yeah. Happy or Happiness, is it? Yeah, we just uh, sh showed it here uh, recently, actually. Oh, it's so wonderful. Yeah, but yeah. even in that, where, where people in more recent years have been studying um, happiness as opposed to depression, um, have, have learned that um, in the West we often believe that, that, that our status in the world or how much money we make constitutes a great deal of our happiness on top of just what you need, shelter and food. But actually it only accounts for 10% they have learned of what happiness is. And in that film they show um, a, a lovely rickshaw, a rickshaw driver from Calcutta, yeah. right? Right, oh absolutely. And, and he's hardly wealthy and he's a very, you know, living off the day-to-day -day means and lives in a, in a shack with holes in the ceiling where the water comes through and he says, but this is my home and we have leaks but I am so grateful that this is my home and when I've been working 14 hours a, a day and my feet hurt from running on the streets pulling rickshaws, when I come home to my, to, to my place, my, I hear my children calling my name and, and I, I can't feel more grateful and I, and I well, I think that ultimately that's what we all want. Yeah. No, no, that's right. But isn't it amazing how, um, you know, you can see that <clears throat> depth of feeling and happiness for someone who it's, we sit here and say they have nothing. Right. But in fact, they have everything. Don't they? Yeah, I think that's so. Um, so you mentioned uh, you took time out to, I don't think you would use the word meditate but uh, maybe you can talk about some of your uh, experiences as to, in that regard, or some of the retreats or places you've gone which have allowed you to personally grow and what it was that you did or who it was that you interacted with. We were talking a little bit before we started, and, she, and uh, we, <laughs> in fact, we were talking about, geez, I'd like to put a picture in my house, and she said, well, uh, my house has pictures of monks everywhere, and that's not everyone's taste. So, uh, but, <laughs> but, but I actually like that myself because I find it a very calming influence. But maybe you can tell us a little bit about that spiritual journey. I think my quest when I was young was really to throw myself into to lifestyles and realities that were dissimilar from my own. That somehow cutting the tethers of of um, communication, especially back when you know there weren't cell phones and we didn't have the, the net, and um, to, to really immerse myself, that was just extremely meaningful to me. Um, and I spent a lot of time, I mean, when I look at my work, uh, inclusive of the slavery, but sort of void of it at the same time, I think it's, it's largely about how we find meaning. That has always been a very curious thing to me. So whether it's through animism or, or Buddhism, or um, Hinduism or Christianity, all of that to me is, is fascinating. And on my journeys away, I, I studied that a lot. I, I was interested to see what it was that moved people in their day-to-day -day life to have faith in the greater context. And um, yeah, I spent a lot of time um, in retreats, both mostly Hindu and really mostly Buddhist, and uh, silent retreats for 30 days, and sometimes even being um, es ensconced in a small cell of darkness um, or, or, or a cave, like a small cave where I would just remain there by myself. And I mean, 
that's been a long time. I was, I was in my early 20s then. But there was a definite feeling of, well, this is it, and you, you cannot speak. You're forbidden to speak. And what I learned through it is that all the answers or the, the discontentedness or anxiousness that would come up in me, the more that I sat with it, the more the answers would just, frankly, naturally come. And um, I think in, for me in that way, confronting my own deemings was... Um, I don't know, there was a certain grace that came out of it, so much so that when those 30-day retreats ended and it was time to speak again, I sort of held on to the last precious seconds of, of that quiet because I knew the minute I uttered a word, I would fall right into the, the marvel of language and, and, and further the distraction of always being busy with it, too. Well, you know, it's sort of interesting. Have any, many of you done the 30-day retreat? Or? Uh, for, you know, those of you who have not, uh, at least I, I think it can be a pretty frightening yeah, it can be. place because, you know, as you feel, start feeling uncomfort or discomfort with yourself when you have nobody to distract you from reflecting, then all these things come up which you have to deal with. And I think uh, at least there's sort of this transition point where it gets a little scary and you want to not do that and then it quiets down and you can actually, I, I think, get some work done. So do you have a, uh, a contemplative or meditative practice at all or do you find, and I, I can tell you this for myself, you know, I, I did this for a long time in a very dedicated way and now it's more a part of how I function and I take brief periods of time but I don't spend hours anymore. Yeah, um, I've, I've gone in and out of practice. Certainly th at that time in my life, I spent a lot of time sitting. What I've done the last few years is um, wake up in the morning and, and head out each morning for an hour with my big pooch, Romeo. And, um, and it's, it's, it's really my time. And even though it's, it's dark, it's, it's to me, it's just marvelous to walk out beneath the stars and to watch the light crawl into the air and to have utter quiet when the world, for the most part, is, is, is still asleep or, or perhaps still just in their homes. And, um, and you know, that, that has provided me with such grace. I mean, for me, walking um, has always been a great meditation. And, and when I think of all the biggest decisions I've made in my own life, they've, they've actually been made when I've been trekking or walking or... It, just in motion, somehow everything clicks in. It's like this cleaning of my brain and my heart gets clear and it's been really marvelous. And I would say that's been a pretty big part of my life. And, and, and equally so, I've been doing sort of like a, a gratitude project the last few years where um, it, it was not really intentional. It's just that I had gone through a rough period and I, I started to do a practice of really having gratitude and, and acknowledging it on a daily basis of something that was very important to me. And, and, and in all frankness, um, like I have so much gratitude for my life, I, I cannot say enough. And even when there is difficulty around it, that abundance of, of goodness for, for the love I have in my life, for, for um, what, what I get to experience on a daily level with, with um, the work I do and meeting people in the world and, and my dear family, I, I just feel that gratitude, and, and I actually believe wholeheartedly that when we focus on such things, that is what grows. You know, that life is perception, and whatever it is that we choose to focus on is something that, that ushers into a, a nice path. It's interesting you, you mentioned gratitude, because I think, especially in the West where we're so materialistic, what happens to many of us is that... Um, you know, we look at somebody and we say, they have more than I have, and whatever that I have or what they have is, and we sit there and say, somehow put that uh, in this pedestal that their life is better or, or they have more and maybe I deserve more. Uh, and oftentimes, there, I think there's a tendency, and I think this is one of our failings of our modern society is, we have this tendency to look up and say, oh, that person has this, versus looking down and, and saying, I am so, so 
blessed to even be here today. And, I, and just doing that practice, I think, every day makes you even have more gratitude. And, you know, this gets back to the travels you've done in some of the places uh, where there's just dire poverty, mm. uh, there's hardship, uh, there's death. Um, when you travel to these places, maybe you can just give us an idea of actually what it takes to do that. And maybe the slavery work is a little bit different and a little bit more dangerous, perhaps, because you're documenting something I think that people want to hide. But just in your other treks, and, and I, I, we'll move over to the slavery aspect of this, but to your other treks, what does it all involve? Because, you know, uh, obviously uh, you're, you don't look like you're a muscled uh, he-man who goes around carrying packs and packs of stuff, but, well... Maybe you are, uh, but uh, uh, he woman or she woman. I guess. That's right. <laughs> Woo! Wow, this is getting interesting. Yes. Yeah, well, we're going. We're. This is. You'll <laughs> this see is where this is going. You, you see where this is going to go. Uh, <laughs> invariably, at these talks, this heads off somewhere where everybody's going. I don't know where this is going. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> that's near, usually near the end. Uh, but so, what's involved in in sort of doing this? Well, you know. Um the simplest answer comes to mind for me, and it is simply just do it. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, well, for me, traveling is like breathing. I, I, I don't know how I would be as a human being if I weren't able to go elsewhere and learn. But um, it's really rather simple for me. It's just really making a plan, trusting my instincts, and letting what, what percolates inside of me rise up and have a voice, and then, um, I'll select somewhere that I want to go, and often that will be um, tempered by how vulnerable I feel that culture is to change, or something important that somehow derives more of my attention than otherwise. And it's really a matter of going there. I'm not a person um, who travels with a crew or assistance um, because my work is so sensitive. I find that the quieter it, it is, probably mostly for myself, the the deeper the connection with the individual that I'm photographing. But what is necessary is, you know, proper visas and, and permits. And um, I need a, a translator who can impart my mission and what it is that I want to do. In fact, they are largely my voice, and, and their sensitivity and their own body is deeply important to me. So the translators I work with um, have to kind of be, we, we must be aligned in that way. And then I have people who have a lay of the land and, and know it well and know how to get me to certain places. And, but it's really quite simple and, you know. So is that sort of you, whatever has inspired you to go to this place, then do you then show up and then arrange this once you're there then? Or is it in advance? It's kind of both. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm making it really simple. But I mean, I, I research a lot prior. I have a team that also researches. We make a plan, and I'll go there, and then I'll revisit the plan. And no matter what, um, there is always room, and eternally this is the best thing, that, that things change, and they're not as I deemed they would be, and I've learned to sort of trust that because magic always happens. And um, so, so with all the planning and things that go along with it, it's kind of this let go you know, thing that I've learned over the years, the years and in, in so doing, it allows for the magic to happen, you know. And it's interesting you say let go because uh, um, I was looking a little earlier today at the um, film clip that you sent me, and maybe you can talk about letting go or how do you get uh, that authentic connection to the person you're taking a picture of, because, you know, many of your pictures are, I mean, they just pull you in and you, you feel that person. But, you know, oftentimes for people who get their picture taken, you're sitting there trying to go, you know, yeah. and put this fake smile on. And, and I think the natural <laughs> tendency is to try to present your best picture. At the same time, though, you want an authentic picture of, of really what's there. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because I once for a brief period of time went through a time where I was making images with the idea of an audience in mind instead of being in my own body. And that didn't go so well. 
it didn't go horribly, but it didn't go so well. And I've really learned to trust my instincts. And um, actually, when I'm out in the field and I'm with people that I'm working with, I'm not a photographer who makes a lot of images of a person. You know, often photographers are thought of um, to, to make an easy 30 images in a matter of 10 seconds, especially these days. I don't work that way. I really rely on the elements coming together and making an exposure when, when that convergence happens. And I have found that, you know, when you make an image of somebody, like you're saying, there's this instant awareness that one is being photographed. And with that self-consciousness, um, we, we each alter ourselves. And then that authentic instant is, well, it's kind of removed itself. So um, I trust that, that in being with another person, um, you know, there's a camera there, but it's really not about the camera. It's about the connection. The work is not... The technique is sort of a backdrop from which I come forth and, and just am myself with the knowledge that I have that covered because it's, it's about showing up for someone in a way that they show up. And it sounds simple, but it's really just that. Do, to get some of these really natural photos, though, do you sort of hang around enough where you become part of the woodwork? Or, I mean, does it happen where you sort of walk in and uh, you just take a picture. I never work without permission, which leads back to having a translator and having them impart who I am. Um, often I will have permission and then I won't work for some time, until some time later. So that, that sense of being in oneself is <coughs> more there. Um, there are times when I go into situations, for example, with the slavery work, when the, the work was so sensitive that I would have uh, sometimes just a, a mere 10 to 15 minutes to do a, a great deal of work. That was very different. It's very spontaneous, very fast. It w I used a small format camera so I could be spontaneous and agile and honestly be able to run like hell when I needed to. A lot of my work is made, um, the vast majority is with a, a 19th century view camera. So it's a four by five um, view camera that I actually have to set up. And so I liken that oddly to something like fishing coming from a vegetarian here. But, um, but it's, it's, it's about putting something together and seeing something, but then waiting for the moments, like all these, the, the, the human being in it and the light and all of these things to come together where I'll make an exposure. And mind you, when I work like that, I work with a four by five sheet of film that you individually load into the camera. So you can't do this. You, right. you must just make one image and then you have to take out the film and replace it with another sheet. It's wow. kind of funny. For us who have traveled to some of these foreign countries, sometimes you get ill. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can tell us uh, 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 some of your worst case situations. Uh, actually, uh, on our way over here, uh, we were talking about um, an event that occurs. How often the coup? Oh, the Kumbh Mela, which occurs on, in the, its largest form every 12 years. Yeah. So, you know, this is on the bank of the Ganges. And there are tens of millions of people, and there's not uh, sanitary conditions. So where do you think they throw all of their waste? And, and it go, yet there are all these people bathing. And imbibing themselves. And imbibing themselves, whatever. What is imbibing yourself? Drinking, eating. So, uh, uh, so I, I think you had mentioned you had gotten sick the uh, last time. Have you had multiple close calls, and that's just part of the way it is, or do you try as much as possible to be very safe? Well, I... And, and, and you know, it seems as though the more desolate you get, yeah. uh, the harder it is to maintain that. Yeah, yeah. I always know that I'm bound to get something. It's sort of just like, well, I'm going out there. The chances of me getting something are, are um, not slim. Um, I'm pretty mindful of my health, but I've certainly, yeah, when I was at the Kumbh Mela last, I was in the hospital a few times, and... Um, had this horrible condition that they couldn't label, and um, I couldn't move for a long time, and I refused to go home because I had some other work I wanted to do in Nepal. And when I arrived there, I failed again, and they had to have the doctor come to um, the hotel to see me. But gradually, I got better. And then when I got home, I had developed pneumonia from all of it. So 
that's just one experience. I, I hope that this time, as I'm returning this next month, um, that I won't actually have anything. Why don't you tell them what your protective mechanism is? I want. It. <laughs> yes, I, I've I've gotten smart now, and I've ordered some waders. So, so I, I, <laughs> I'm going to be waddling around in these waders, and all these pilgrims will be looking at me even more humorously than usual. Yes, yes. So uh, I, I really want a picture of that. Actually, that's yeah. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll get one for you yeah, for sure. So, um, why don't you? Uh, uh, maybe we can switch over to. Uh, this issue of slavery, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I know a little bit of the history of it, but maybe you can tell us, while I think prior to this engagement in this topic, you were really documenting the lives of indigenous peoples and indigenous peoples themselves, tell us about what changed and uh, how this is defining your work now. Well, of course, my previous work um, has largely been about inspiring unity through images. And I've always had a belief that, you know, we so frequently make quick judgments by seeing someone as different. And, and so we might be in fear of that difference as opposed to um, seeing the difference with a sense of wonder or curiosity, which completely changes everything. And that had always been my... Um, well, I guess the mission that inspires my work and how I like to share my work. And um, actually, when I was at uh, a, a, an exhibition, I had met a supporter of Free the Slaves, this organization that um, their mission is to eradicate slavery in our lifetime, actually. Well, we started talking about slavery, but the real truth is that I started learning about it because I had no idea I knew that slavery existed in the way that I suppose many do. Like, I knew there was trafficking to some degree, but I had no idea that more than 27 million people are enslaved in the world today. That's more than double the amount of people that were taken from Africa during the entire transatlantic slave trade. I was completely blown away. I felt like a freight train just rammed into me. And I think mostly I was um, angry at myself for not knowing. I thought, how could I not know? My whole occupation is based on <laughs> observing and seeing people, and yet I had failed to, um, to see this atrocity. And well, the truth is I heard about it and learned about it, and I couldn't sleep. I felt this deep anxiety, and in, within weeks I, I flew down to Los Angeles to meet um, with one of Free the Slaves. Um, uh, well, director and actual uh, founder of the organization, and and I offered up my help, help because I had this idea, which is definitely based on my previous work. Um, it is my true belief that if we see one another as fellow human beings instead of us and them and the other, that it becomes very difficult to um, to tolerate atrocities. And and so I thought, well, if I can go out and have the opportunity to, to meet these people and to make images of them in their forced labor that perhaps by having an exhibition, you know, the viewers will have a moment to stand before someone who indeed is not the other but a fellow human being and say, this is not okay. This will not work for me. And they will rise up and have it, you know, ignite change themselves. And, and so that is sort of the spirit behind the, this particular body of work and, and the exhibition and book. What was the first experience? Where? Well, it was interesting because the countries that I went to document slavery were countries I had been to many times before. Some I even considered like my second home where I spent like four years. And so when I went back this time, it was like seeing the, the, the skeletons in the closet, right? Um, the first place that I went was India. And uh, I believe that the first instance of slavery I saw was involving textiles. So we would go into these isolated villages um, when, you know, the, I worked with abolitionists on the ground that were indigenous to those particular countries. So they were partners of Free the Slaves that for the most part, is located in the U.S. Um, 
and though they're a multinational country, what I love about them is that they work with people that are indigenous to their own countries. So they would bring me in under these very sensitive circumstances when the the brokers would be away, the managers, the the slaveholders, and and that is why I had these very small windows of opportunity. And I remember going into these these dark dugout homes. It was like 120 degrees. It was so hot. And there were, um, the, the floor of these structures was earth, and the floor was dug out so that the loom was set above it. And children as young as like seven years old were working these looms. Now these looms are extremely difficult to, to use. And they're strong so that if they make a mistake and, and let the lever go, it snaps and it can, it can take their finger off. I mean, it's pretty intense. Um, that was what I first saw. Then I moved on to brick kilns, I think, in some days beyond that. And I remember entering the first brick kiln. We, we have gold up at the moment. But um, the brick kilns were like walking into ancient Egypt, literally, like these hot kilns that the temperature outside alone was between 120 and 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you have this kiln that is cooking. So the heat is even more extraordinary, and people are going from the kiln, loading these bricks on their head up to four, uh, 18 at a time, each weighing four pounds. And they were cloaked in this heavy blanket of dust. There were men and women and children, entire families, in fact, that are, that are taking these bricks and walking hundreds of yards to a truck where they're loading it some, someplace away. And it, it was, to see them do it once was extraordinary, but to think that they do it monotonously and mechanically without pause for, you know, 16 or 18 hours a day, wow, that took the wind out of me. And I remember seeing these women that were so exhausted and so, they, I ju they just looked like these mechanical beings. And it, it just made me just begin crying, which was completely inappropriate. And, um, and the abolitionist that I was with grabbed me and said, Lisa, you cannot do that here. This is not safe for you, and it's not safe for them. I mean, I was under clear instruction that I could not give any money, nor promises, nor involve myself in any way with them that would create a relationship, because I had my own particular gift for being there, and that was making images of them that would hopefully ignite change back home. But the organizations have a very clear and concise way of working that, that liberates people. And my interference or others would actually disastrously <laughs> affect that. Well, it'd probably but it was hard. push it more underground or hidden yeah. away or, yeah. or punishment. <laughs> A punishment or, or, or removing all those people and bringing them to another place that would take all the longer to find them again. And, right, right. Right. What, uh, so are they just basically given room and board and then for that they're just work endlessly? Yes, but their room and board is, is a brick structure that's about five or six feet long and four feet wide and is about this tall and has a tin roof and they and their whole family are in it. I mean, the, the livestock that they had on the grounds of those kilns, the, the structures were probably four or five times larger for the animals. You, I think, shared a story in this uh, movie that uh, it was so hot that your camera would stop working. Uh, and uh, so she would go back to their car and turn on the air conditioning so the camera would start uh, working again. And then reflecting on how the camera was being treated better than these people. Yeah, it's pretty heartbreaking. There's a beautiful image uh, in one of your books, uh, one of the slavery books, or his, one of those images in there. Uh, and it's, it's actually a, a beautiful image at least in the sense of its composition and color, but there's a backstory to this, and this is the one with the hands. Oh, the colored hands? Yes, and yeah. uh, maybe you can describe that and uh, tell the story. Yeah, is it, up there? It, it is somewhere in here, and you might have seen it, but it's all the colored hands, the blue, red, yeah. and black. And um, you know, this is actually a family portrait. Um, these are a, a, a family of silk dyers 
all enslaved. And uh, the father has a black hand, and the blue and the red hands are his sons. To me, it's a really touching image. I, I remember them saying to me through the translator, um, you know, that they work and they, they absolutely get nothing, and they cannot leave the premises. And that still they have a dream, which I love, because people still have these dreams, that someday they will be able to be in a, in a situation in which they can still do their same craft but actually get paid for it. And it was, it was very touching to hear them you know, describe that in such a you know, concise, short, accurate way. When you talk to the people from Free the Slave, and I know you go there as a photographer, but when you talk to the people uh, who are running this organization, mm -hmm. I would assume they have some interaction or with the people who are enslaving these people, or ultimately, or do they? Or The slaveholders? Yeah. Not really. I mean, it, perhaps down the line, how they work, which is kind of, it, it, well, it's, it's wonderful because They'll go, there are entire villages, for example, that um, people have been enslaved for sometimes generations. It's interesting because, um, you know, like 150 years ago, buying a slave would be the equivalent of an American, uh, an American man's annual salary. Now you can have an entire family of people enslaved over a debt as small as $18. And um, so these villages that are enslaved, um, you know, they'll, they'll have abolitionists on the ground again that are from those particular countries go in, if you will, undercover, and start talking with, with the people in such a way, I'll just give you a quick, a short example, but they'll go in and start befriending people and say, wow, it would be such a terrific thing if you could come for dinner this week. Oh, I'm so sorry, I, I have to work. We'll say, how about you come on Saturday? Oh, I, I can't come, I have to work. Sunday? No, no, I'm working. Wow, you must really love your job, you know? How much do you get paid? Oh, I, I don't get paid. And so the, the way they, they work is by making people aware of, of their own circumstance. Because as we know here um, in the States, just as a small example, you know, you can have a, a battered woman. We'll just take that as one of the examples. And if we, we, we were to go and rescue her and take her out of her, her predicament, which is often necessary, it is not very unlikely that she might meet a, a new you know, man or partner that would, um, that would appear different and look different, but the, the possibility of him beating her again is likely to occur. Well, it's the same in slavery that if you rescue people from slavery, you get a very different result that's short-lived as opposed to liberating someone, having someone be responsible for their own definition of freedom. They are less likely by this enormous percentage to fall therein again to right. an enslaved Well, I mean, that's all they know. Right. And you know, this is when you mentioned domestic violence, of course, you know, some people, and, and I think the reality is, you know, they fall back on the demon they know versus the unknown demon. Right, and, uh, because, Yeah, and I, I think that's a tendency. One of your photographs is of a young man named, is it Kofi? Kofi. Kofi, maybe you can, and it's a really touching uh, photo. Maybe you can tell us about the photo and the young man. Yeah, this is great because um, it's, it's, uh, it's great to become aware of slavery, but it's all the more exciting to become aware of the liberation from slavery. Kofi, um, I'm so sorry that I, I did a scrolling thing this evening because I thought it might be easier for a conversation. Um, so the images are passing by, and you might recall it. Um, it's a young boy. It's a black and white image of a, a child with uh, water all over him. And the child's name is Kofi. Um, I met him in Ghana. He had been actually rescued from a fishing village on Lake Volta where actually more than 4,000 children are enslaved on this largest man-made lake in the world. Um, I met Kofi at a shelter where Free the Slaves helps to rehabilitate children of slavery. They have to rehumanize them and frankly teach them to be children again. Um, so in that image, he was actually pouring water over his head at a well and having a pretty grand time. He's a wonderful child. The beautiful thing about it is that as we're sitting here talking, he's actually been reunited with his actual parents. And what's even better is his parents have been given skills to um, earn a living and, more importantly, given skills to be able to see 
the tactics of a trafficker because largely trafficking occurs because um, because people are lied to. They're given a promise of a you know a, a better job or a job in general or an education. And once a person accepts that and they're brought away, they're then completely exploited and taken advantage of and controlled through violence to for, be forced in whatever labor that um, break hold, uh, uh, broker houses for them and the slaveholder, and they, are, they have no choice to walk away, none at all. They're totally under violent control. There's some images of um, mining, I think. Is that in uh, Ghana or? Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that circumstance, because at least in those images, I mean, uh, the many of the ones that I've looked at have been primarily males, sometimes children, but oftentimes uh, men. But in those images, you see entire families. I mean, you see them panning for gold and carrying a child, and they're there for hours, and the children... Yeah, the, there's a few different types of uh, illegal mining and mining in general um, around the world. But in Ghana, I visited three types. One was a cave mine, which would be the most, we would relate to you walk into a cave and you go in for miles and miles and mine. The other is a shaft that, that is literally a structural that's like four by four feet that descends into the earth countless feet. And lastly, there's the water mining that is often done near rivers. And they, they make these huge dig outs of the earth that would be cavernous, like easily as big as this room. And many of them w that would fit into a size of a football field, hidden way in the jungle. Like I had to walk three hours um, to, to find this. And when I, it finally came out of this tiny path in the jungle where there was nothing and nobody, and then you come to this end and it's just open and you just see these endless holes filled with countless slaves. It was, it was mind-blowing. So indeed, there were um, many men that were panning, but in fact, there are actually um, a lot of the holes where there are just women. And those women have children on the backs. And, and I think the most troubling thing outside of the fact that they're enslaved is that those waters are utterly and completely infested with mercury because mercury is used in the extraction Thanks. process. Yeah. And it gathers the, the gold from the earth. Um, and so they're constant, I mean, their entire time there, they're being poisoned. Tell me about your trip down the 4x4 four four shaft, because I saw a picture of you. Oh, yeah. I, um, I mean, can you imagine, at least the picture I saw, I mean, 4x4, four four, it goes straight down, and you have to sort of pry yourself in there to go down, and it's quite deep and dark, and if a disaster occurs, there's nothing. Yeah, um, those mines are, I believe, well, they're all dangerous in their own right, for certainly many will die from the, the pollutants of the mercury, but the, the mine shafts that drop into the earth are held up by tree limbs, like sort of all around, and they go into the earth hundreds of feet. So when they go down, they often do so for 48 hours or 72 hours at a time, and they don't come back up. So inside the bowels of the earth, it's very hot and it's very wet. And all you can hear is this cacophony of primitive tools, you know? And you hear this coughing and coughing because the dust in there infiltrates their lungs and you just hear this echoing. It's, it's a very strange sound down there. Um, what often happens is after they've been down and they come back up, they're carrying these sacks that are full of heavy, heavy boulders that later will be brought to a pounding site. And when they come up, um, you know, they're exhausted and they're, they're full of such fatigue and they're climbing up and the limbs are quite wet and all they need is one loss of grip and they're dead. <laughs> they don't survive, it's quite rare. Although I did a few days earlier prior to my own going, descending the mine, um, I met a man that was really cracked open um, who had actually survived, and it was amazing. But it was, it was, you know, it's funny for me, when I was going down, I was not frightened because um, fear in those circumstances does not serve one, for one. And the other is, I think I was so... Um, so deeply affected by the fact that these people have to go down, 
that I wanted to be their torchbearer, if you will. And, um, and actually it was five uh, people that were enslaved that brought me down that shaft and brought me into the mines. And, and actually the image that you saw of me climbing out of the mine, that was made by one of them. I mean, can you imagine, you know, for most of us at least, uh, we usually work 40. Doctors may work a little bit more uh, but hours a week. But, uh, uh, but you know, most of us work voluntarily. That's not to say we don't have jobs, we don't have responsibilities, but on some level we choose. Uh, I mean, can you imagine a situation 16 to 18 hours a day, no choice, you watch your children. <laughs> And you sit there and go, why? I, you know, you sit there and wonder, why would I have children? I mean, uh, you know, to, for uh, a life like that. Did you see, though, uh, even in the context of this horrible situation, moments of joy or happiness? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the things that um, surprises people. But when your life is spent, you know, everything becomes relative. So whether your life is full of hardship or 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 ease. It's your day-to-day -day life, and so um, e even with the miners, when they come up from their 48 or 72 hours, you know, they're up there and they're exhausted, but they have their own form of bantering, and they play. And the women that were in the, mi um, the, the, the water mines, you know, panning for gold, oh, boy, that's a cacophony. I, I mean, like, I could barely hear. It was, they are talking the whole time, working and working and working, and they've got the kids on the back, and there is most certainly a community that is occurring alongside the tragedy, you know? Maybe you can talk about some of your work here in the U.S. Oh, well, it's a very small amount of work. Um, I took on my first project in the United States this particular year. It's the first time I've done any work in the U.S., and, um, and it was actually on, on human trafficking, and I chose, um, you know, the God of Gods, which is uh, Washington, D.C. I thought it was um, potent since it is our capital. Uh, what I found through sharing the work thus far, which um, are from several countries but outside of the United States, is I'll often hear people um, say comments like, wow, you know, it's so horrible that that happens in other countries. Or even comments like, wow, those governments... They just can't, you know, take care of this issue in those countries. And, I, and it really struck me that people do not realize that it occurs in our own backyard. You know, um, the New York Times actually um, said that between 100,000 and 300,000 U.S. children are sold into sex slavery every year. When I was in Washington, D.C., I was working with this astonishing woman named Tina Front, who is a former um, sex slave. She now has this wonderful um, support house for um, trafficking victims, um, children actually, and she's in DC. It's called Courtney's House. She's a marvelous woman, and she graciously took me under her wing. Um, as a photographer, she doesn't normally work with anybody that does photography, photography for obvious reasons. Um, but she brought me in, and um, I met with uh, different uh, survivors. And, um, you know, these survivors could, frankly, be us or our children. It's, um, you know, there, there aren't people, there, there are many people that are brought into the United States um, through trafficking every year, but it is also our own children um, that are vulnerable to this. And it was very difficult, and you know, she also brought me out onto the streets between 4 a.m. and 7 a.m. in the mornings, where the traffickers were on the street with the with the sex slave victims, and walking those streets, um, I, I, it was extremely, really uncomfortable in a different way, because I was not there when, in that case, you know, when I'm often working in the world, I'm there when the traffickers are removed and there's a lot of people working to keep us safe. And when some dangerous situation would occur, we had signals and things so that luckily we were able to get out of there in the nick of time. And so though they were touchy situations and, and frankly they could have gone wrong, they didn't. But when I was doing work in the United States, I was with somebody with whom I had a great deal of trust with, with but it wasn't as though we had a team of people watching. 
but the traffickers were there and they were watching, right? So it was a very different feeling. And, um, and uh, you know, she gave me very clear instructions on how to behave on the street. And so really all I did was listen to her. And clear instructions that if a trafficker spoke to me, to not at all speak tack back to them, and, and most importantly, not to look at them in the eye. There are all these rules on the streets, but but it was very dangerous. And I had, um, you know, an altercation which I won't go into at the moment. But it, it it was very frightening, and it it made me feel vulnerable in a in a new way. And perhaps part of that was that it's in my own backyard, and um, and part of it was that it was a bad situation. And, um, and, you know, when I got home, I had to have a bit of a reckoning with myself that, yeah, you know, this is dangerous stuff, obviously. I'm, I'm enormously aware of all that, but, um, you know, my first uh, project in the U.S. was tough. And I, and I should say, above all else, that, that, you know, this is all occurring on K Street, which is where all the embassies are. This is not like in, in something that we might equate with the Tenderloin or Hunter's Point. This is... This is, um, you know, this is where our politicians. Are. This is where our politicians are, and and all of those streets. When I was going into the area, the streets and the freeways were void of any traffic, as you might imagine. It was why would anybody be out? But when we, when we pulled into K Street, it was bumper to bumper, not moving traffic, and it was all for human sex wow. buying. You know, it was just the buying of sex. And when I descended from the curb onto the street. I in work boots and tattered jeans and a North Face jacket, and I was wired, but I hadn't any cameras, but I was not looking good. Um, all the windows were just like going down because I was immediately a product. And it was scary wow. just to be treated that way and how those people that are not entrepreneurs, they are not women who have chosen prostitution in order to find a means for their life. They have been exploited and they are slaves. And they must be chronically petrified. That is all I can say. It's horrible. What is your next project in terms of either, and maybe we'll talk about the non-slavery, but in terms of the slavery are you, where's your next place you're going? Are you going to do more in the U.S.? Um, I likely will do more in the U.S. And, and you know, my project um, with slavery is, is very heartfelt for me. And uh, we are um, launching a worldwide exhibition to do two things, raise awareness and raise funds to fight slavery. Um, so the body of work is ever-growing. I have just returned from, from Calcutta where I was working in the largest brothel, Sonagachi, in all of Asia. I, I'd imagine in all the world, actually. Um, so at, at, at presently, I don't have any direct plans, but I'm sure something will arrive in the next month where I'll know. And I'm, I'm learning um, that it's important for me to balance it out with, with the other forms of my work because, um, you know, you've got the beast in life and you know, seeing the underbelly so intimately of society is, um, well, it renders a deep pause. And um, I, I'm finding that, you know, my other work, which has housed so much um, grace for me, is, is really important to continue with. And, of course, it's never that I was going to leave it behind or not, not be in um, the motion of making that work, but I'm doing that too, so... Sure. Well, this is the sort of concept of uh, compassion fatigue where you're so overwhelmed with the suffering and, you know, you feel helpless and hopeless and, and sometimes you lose it. And, and that's why it's obviously important to keep uh, this type of balance. Um, let's talk about Bhutan. Okay. <laughs> uh, tell us uh, about that book that's coming out, <laughs> and sort of your involvement, what transpired. Yeah. Lisa lives this very charmed life in some ways, uh, in that she's such a uh, wonderful person and personality, and she opens her hearts up, that uh, she invariably ends up meeting people who bend over backwards to uh, open their, share their lives, or what they're doing, or who they are. So 
tell us a little about Bhutan and the Queen of Bhutan. And Working with Bhutan has been really great because their whole thing is gross national happiness, right? And um, that's an upswing from, from atrocity. Um, um, a, I've been to Bhutan a, a few times, but two years ago I went and ended up meeting up with the Secretary General of the Monistic Body of Buddhism for the country. And I was talking to him about making a book on, on Bhutan because, as perhaps some of you know, it is one of the last remaining um, less touched, lesser touched kingdoms that exist um, since they are so tied about who enters the country, um, they've had less change. I think it was only in 2002 that TVs are, uh, were allowed in and cell phones are rather new. And so that has allowed that country to remain as it has for many centuries to some degree. And um, so the Secretary and General and I came up with sort of a, a plan, an itinerary for me to go around and do this body of work. And when I returned back to Timpu after making the work, um, he wanted to show me a project that was very near his heart. And he brought me out to what is called the Bhutan Youth Development Fund. And um, it's a structure of, of buildings for the young people of Bhutan where, I love this, they, they teach the youth leadership in the, in the finest way because they really want all of their, their youth to, to have a recognition of who they are and how they can you know, help out their own country. And, um, and I was really touched by what they were doing and I um, usually attach um, projects to whatever body of work I'm doing so, um, so that a percentage of the proceeds from that body of work, um, including artwork and and books goes back to a particular organization to help others. And um, I had made a body of work and, and sent it back to the Secretary General and the Development Fund and the Queen of Bhutan, um, um, Deshi, was very gracious and was moved by what I was doing and I, I guess had seen the body of work at the Youth Development Fund and, and offered to write a foreword for the book. And, and further, that when I was to return to um, do the second half of the book, she had asked for an audience with me. So um, when I had returned, I, I had a, an audience with her. And actually, the audience ended up being rather a lot longer than I expected. And, um, and it's been this really neat forming of learning about her and, and her family, and of course, of Bhutan. And uh, this body of work is called Repository of Spirit. And, you know, Bhutan, though it, 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 it does have so much tradition, and I think that's a pillar for that country. Um, like many other countries around the world, they deal with um, drug abuse and teenage pregnancy and the like. And, and so part of the, the Youth Development Fund is, is really to, um, to make stronger that pillar about who they are as, as, as people on their own right, um, void of all the exciting leather jackets and jeans that are elsewhere in the world. And so... Um, yeah, I'm really excited for the, the, the book coming out, and, and Her Highness is, is writing the foreword, and, um, and uh, Bob Thurman is going to write the, the preface, and it's a, work in, it's a work in progress, but hopefully it will be coming out this next year. So I, I'm, I'm very jealous because I was supposed to be in Bhutan last year, and my trip got canceled, That's so right. I'm holding this against her right now. As you become more and more famous, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm harassing mm -hmm. her. Uh, uh, <laughs> tell us about Gillian Anderson. This is the X-Files. I, I'm just... Um, so, so there's been a movie made. I'm, I'm going to, and, and she'll tell you the rest. I'm going to interrupt her. But uh, So there's this movie being made, and uh, loosely based, on the work related to the slave trade. Yes, the, 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 the film is called Sold, and it is um, based on the award-winning book by Patricia McCormick, who made this lovely book called Sold. It's about a young girl who, uh, it's about her journey, really, into being sold in, and trafficked into India. And um, so the characters in the, in the film and in the book are, for the most part, um, all Nepalese and Indian. 
and um, the director of the film had come to my studio because, of course, the film was about slavery and he knew I was doing this work. And it was really kind of a meeting of the minds and the heart to, to have this particular um, sp time span. And uh, he was so moved by the work that he called me a few days later and said that he was going to write in a character that was inspired by me um, into the, the screenplay. And that's really it. This is a supporting role to the film. It's not a, a, the major role. In fact, the major role is this lovely, amazing child and her, her journey. But Gillian Anderson is playing this part. And um, uh, Emily Thompson is the executive producer. And I'm really excited for it to come out because I truly believe that you know, the, the one strong thing that one can do with art and, and film and writing and all these things is that, you know, it, it exposes people to something that's occurring. And, you know, I think about how many people will be touched by it. And it's, it's, it's wonderful. I'm really happy about it. I think we're running out of time in terms of our conversation. I mean, what an amazing story, amazing life, amazing person. Uh, I know some of you may have some questions. We have mics set up on either side. If you do, uh, please feel free to ask Christine, I mean Lisa, Christine, uh, any questions you might have. And uh, we'll chat for maybe 10 or 15 more minutes. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what uh, made you decide to do what you do, travel photography, and the message that you um, want to convey to the world, what what made you decide first decide to do that? Yeah, it's a great question, and I have a really clear answer. Um, I always think of the people that I photograph as my professors, really in life. I I wanted to go and learn how to live richly, internally. And I suppose, for me, there was a little bit, I, I, I think I, if you were here at the beginning, I, I spoke a little about having a chaotic childhood and stuff. And I think for me, going elsewhere and cutting the tethers and, and meeting people from whom I could learn about grace and gratitude, that's really what drove me. And it, 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 I, I feel like it was really finding these elders and hearing about their wisdom and what really made their lives important. That's how it all began. I photograph in order to learn about myself. It's funny because people have said to me, you know, you know, you, you, you go out and you photograph and you, you bring this wisdom home, right? But really, I went to photograph to save my life. And, and I feel like I bring images home. And whatever relationship is, is beheld between the viewer and the image is, that belongs to them, if you will. But the impetus is that it's really learning about myself and finding my own way. Alisa, first of all, thank you for your work. Um, I actually grew up in some of those places in India yeah. where they where you had those brick pe people carrying bricks and all that. Yeah. And and you probably know the statistics, although then not all of them are slaves. Absolutely. Three, Three hundred million people live on less than a dollar a day in India itself. And uh, it's, it's economic slavery. They don't have a choice. They will do anything to survive. And then they'll have children because that's the norm. So uh, right. when I start writing about it, I go through empathic distress myself. And even though I'm at a part of Seeker, I still go through a lot of compassion fatigue. Worse than that, when I write about it, hundreds of my friends who have seen it, who have experienced it, tell me not to write about it not to show pictures of it oh. because it makes India and the cities they came from look bad. Mm. Did you go through that when you were writing about and showing pictures of women in sex trade and how did you deal with it in the US? Well, well it's interesting because um, my work has been viewed all over the world and, and so I get emails from all over the world every day. And mostly, especially from India, Boy, people are just so happy that the that the work is being shown. It's been very interesting. Um, so I have not had that happen where people. I understand from where that would arrive, you know, arise. I mean, that makes total sense to me. But as of yet, I I I haven't had that comment. But I understand why somebody would. 
Hi, thank you for bringing your images. I have a, question, a couple, two-part question. Slavery is really about economics. And my first question is, what is the trail to delivering the items that have been mined or the silk that's been woven? What's the economic trail? And second, is there any interest or is there any attention being given to um, not purchasing those products or uh, some type of barriers, economic sanctions against yeah. those products? You know, I, I really believe that probably every one of us is participating in slavery unknowingly through what we purchase. In fact, even if we brought, brought, uh, purchased a garment that was not itself made from slavery, it may have been made in a building where bricks were, you know, made that building that were from somewhere where people were enslaved. So it's, um, I don't know all the trails, and, and I ought to be really clear with everyone that I've learned a great deal about slavery in the last years, but I'm a photographer, I'm not an expert in slavery, and there are many organizations, some of which I can uh, share with you, um, that you might be able to get a more direct and important answer for you. But, um, but um, there is a, a wonderful website called footprint.org, and, and they actually do trail these things. And there's also a, a, an, an app, do you know what that app is called? Is it Footprint? It might be Footprint, where it, where it actually will, will tell you, like if you put in a store, it'll tell you if they've discovered anything in their chain so that you can actually decide where you want to put your money. Mm -hmm. But I think it's great, and, and actually, I believe that the more of us know about that and the more that, that question gets asked, um, we will have a lot more answers to it, and therefore, um, things will be controlled. As it happens, um, slavery accounts for more than $13 billion annually worldwide in profits. I mean, that's crazy, and it's only because it works, right? So, thank you. Thank you. you. Yes, sir. Thank you for your evocative images. Uh, I'm involved in a project in San Francisco mm. that is documenting the impact of development and speculation in the Soma area of San Francisco on the homeless and the single room occupancy hotel population. And I guess what I'm looking for is some ideas about how to encourage them to speak to the camera and become the stars of this documentary rather than my basically going around and finding someone who says this and says that and then stitching it together with the appropriate experts and B-roll to make, to make a document. You mean to, to, to create a relationship in which you can um, talk yes. to people and they will be able to give you some time right. and, and, unguardedly? Right, and, and, and I find that it's initially it's been, I won't say frustrating, I think I'm more frustrated with myself in terms of my inability to uh, to, to reach into them, to let them feel free, not to worry about the camera, mm. not to worry about the technology, but just to tell their heartfelt story the mm -hmm. way they want to tell it. And I, I wondered if you had any uh, tips or I, I, you know, words of wisdom for me that would help me uh, in that journey. Well, what comes off the top of my head from what you've just said, um, you said you're more concerned with your own feelings of I think everything begins inside, so if you can find a freedom in yourself that you allow yourself that space, I think that's number one. Because I've always found um, um, with most people, with, with photographing or videoing people, um, the biggest hindrance is if you feel that you're imposing, then you are, uh -huh. because they'll feel that. But if you feel that you're giving someone the room to tell an important story that will alter their lives and perhaps others, or in whatever, I'm saying that for your particular project, mm -hmm. um, to come from that place and just be super, super authentic and honest about it, and then set that camera up and, and, and then remove yourself spiritually from the camera and get right into that person. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking a risk to take the pictures. I really appreciate it. Um, my question is related to the previous lady, what she said. Yeah. Um, so when you go to exhibition or publish your books, like, would you consider adding information about what we can do every day? So you just mentioned about the, you know, here is the app you, we could use, like a foot, 
print, right? Right. And the other things I could think about is, for example, like, you know, when we buy products, sometimes there is a tag saying fair trade. That's right. Well, Starbucks, they say fair trade. And for us, we just pay maybe a dollar more, five dollars more, but consequence are really big. And people don't know what does fair trade mean. Right. Or when people buy diamonds, we could ask a simple question, is this blood free? Right. Meaning like the diamond did not come from war zones or child laborers mm. and the company uh, that can say, yes, it's blood free. They know where these diamonds are coming from. So when, you know, we'll see people in Palo Alto buy diamonds, maybe that's something, you know, they can ask. Or another thing is uh, there is a certification companies try to get because it's very honorable. It's called the global social, global corporate citizenship. And they have to pass a lot of criteria. And I think one of which is um, compliance with the human rights. And maybe you mm. can kind of, you know, advocate like when you purchase stocks in terms of investments, look at yes. the certification. And when you buy products, for example, there are two identical products. One is made by a company without that particular certificate versus one with a certificate. Maybe we could consider twice, like, okay, I'm going to pay $5 more, but I like the company because of the certification. So yeah, hallelujah. I kind of wonder if it's possible for you to consider adding, you know, one page, one flyer at your exhibition, kind of mentioning about what we can do in every day. I love nice. that. Great Thank point. you so much. And um, I should say that in, in the book, uh, Slavery Here, um, uh, by the way, the proceeds from the book directly fight slavery. But in the back, there's two pages on what you can do. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Further on my website, there's mm -hmm. a partners page, and it, it lists different websites um, mm -hmm. where you can go right to it, and they have... Um, they have very distinct things that that that, that one can do. Okay. Um, um, and we have a flyer uh, in the gallery as very well that good, we thank hand you. out. But the coolest thing is that in the exhibition that's being created uh, to to go out this next year or this year actually um, has all of that information, and we're we're putting in a lot of social media so that. Um, so, so that you can learn about things right away, but not only that, you could take initiative right then and there while you're feeling, you know, that that sense of passion. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you for for saying all that. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Unfortunately, and I'm sorry, we've run out of time, but you may be able to ask as we go out. Uh, we are uh, done tonight. I really want to thank Lisa. I would also like to say there are examples of her work, some of her books and images are actually out in front. Uh, we were a little late getting here. Uh, but uh, I would encourage you to take a look at them. Uh, Lisa Christine, you can find her on the web. Uh, actually, a great joy for me is that Lisa and I are actually heading to India together uh, on the 14th. Uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, part of a group that, are, that is teaching neuroscience to 10,000 monks. And Lisa is going to be there. Uh, uh, photographing the monks and, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So it's, it's going to be a, actually uh, a very special trip. So again, thank you all so much for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.